Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Ambassador Evangelism. Uh, we just did a scripture reading verse or scripture reading video for the Bass Chapel page. And now Ambassador Evangelism is a ministry under the authority of Bass Chapel. And we meet some Saturdays and go through some kind of a theological book that is heavily dosed with scripture. We are currently going through The Whole Christ by Sinclair Ferguson. And I wanted to just kind of go over chapter 10 that we talked about today. The, the full title, subtitle of The Whole Christ by Sinclair Ferguson is Legalism, Antinomianism, and Gospel Assurance. Why the Marrow Controversy Still Matters. Um, this book takes us through exactly what it says. The Marrow Controversy is a was a controversy about this book called The Marrow of Modern Divinity, written by Edward Fisher in the 1600s. Um, it was discovered in the 1700s by Thomas Boston and brought up a big controversy about what is biblical Christianity versus legalism versus antinomianism. Legalism is that we must do something to be saved. Um, antinomianism is you don't have to do anything once you're saved. Biblical Christianity teaches we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we can't do anything at all to be saved, but it's a sovereign act of God, his pure grace that saves us, but in response, we do repent. We do do good works. We do serve him. We do love others. But it's all as a response to the gospel. So that's antithesis to legalism and antinomianism. And we can have gospel assurance. And that's what this chapter is about. Chapter 10, the one that we discussed today, is titled, How Assurance of Christ Becomes Assurance of Salvation. It's the idea, well, Christ is trustworthy. So I can be assured that I am saved to the uttermost because tr Christ himself is trustworthy. Um, so, But I want to kind of go over some of the stuff we talked about today because I think it would be beneficial to people who weren't in class today. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the, the book Marrow of Modern Divinity, it comes across as a conversation between a new Christian, Neophytus, a gospel preacher, Evangelista, a legalist named Nomista, and an antinomian named Antinomista. So they're all conversing in this, trying to give counsel to Neophytus, the new Christian. So Neophytus, um, Evangelista says, you look very heavy. It made me think of Pilgrim's Progress, the burden on the back of Christian in that you need, typically, most covers show Christian with the burden. This was a book written by uh, by John Bunyan uh, back in the 1600s as well. And so Evangelista says, Neophytus, you look very heavily. And he may be trusting in Christ, but he may not have that gospel assurance. He may still have that burden upon his back, just like Christian in, in uh, Bunyan's book did. So Neophytus says, I was thinking of that place of scripture where the apostle exhorts us to examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith or not. Now that's 2 Corinthians 13, 5. And I think I preached on that scripture back toward the end of the year at Bass Chapel. Um, you can find it on our YouTube page. Um, just go to at Bass Chapel Baptist, I think is what we're listed as on there. Um, but to examine ourselves. And yeah, we should examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. He said, I would gladly hear how I may be sure that I'm in the faith. Evangelista says, you have grounded your faith upon such a firm foundation as will never fail you. The promises of God in Christ is of tried and truth, is, a, is a, of a tried truth, and never yet failed any man, nor ever will, is the ground that you're trusting on, is that on your good works? Is that on uh, your church attendance? Is it on being baptized? Is it on taking Lord's Supper? Is it on over having last rites performed over you before you die? Is it on getting married in the church? 
Is it on reading your Bible every day? No, the ground, that firm foundation is on Jesus Christ. And he has never, ever let anyone down. He has never failed. So, it says a man by faith directly lays hold upon Christ and concludes assurance from thence. Now, Neophytus says, well, how can I be assured that I've done this? Well, Evangelista replies, it seems that you do not want a ground for your believing, but for your believing that you believed. So many people, they, they have faith that they had faith. Preachers will sometimes tell people, well, when you get saved, write it in the front of your Bible that date, and every time you doubt your salvation, look at that. Well, that's having faith in faith. That's believing that you believed. We want to look to Christ and to look to him as the grounds for our faith, as he is the only firm foundation. That ink will fade in my Bible. That ink, or if you write it in pencil, it can be erased. I am having faith in faith, and that is not a firm foundation in a feeling I maybe once had, or that I repeated a prayer from a preacher one time, or that I walked an aisle one time, or that I got baptized. Those are all, you know, fine things. We should pray. We should be at church. We should be baptized. But those are all responses to God making us a new creature. So Evangelist is giving him good advice here. It sounds like you want to believe that you believed. So what he wants to know, this is Ferguson talking, is not how can I be sure that Christ is able to save me, but how can I be sure that I have believed in the Christ who saves? He's not really struggling with the ability of Christ. Christ is able to save to the uttermost. He wants to have faith in his faith. He wants to have assurance that he truly believed. That's a struggle that many Christians have. So assurance, Thomas Boston, is, like I said, discovered this book, A Mirror of Modern Divinity, in one of his members' homes, and he asked to borrow it, and he read it, and it greatly impacted his preaching. And so much so that he later on published an edition of the book that had his study notes in it. And that's what has been reproduced here that, uh, that I've got. It, all, it has Thomas Boston's study notes in it. Um, but for Boston, Thomas Boston, assurance is a three-dimensional ministry of the Holy Spirit. Number one, he shines on the Word of God and the saving promises of God. Number two, he shines on his own work in our hearts, making us new creatures. Um, that we see the harmony in our lives between justification and sanctification. And that we don't confuse the two. That's been a, a huge issue. And number three, he bears witness with our own spirit. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our own spirit. That's from Romans chapter 8. So Christ and faith. Assurance of salvation. This is... Ferguson talking here. Assurance of salvation is the fruit of faith in Christ. Christ is able. He is able to and does, in fact, save all those who come to him through faith. Trust in Christ who is able to save. There is a certain confidence and assurance, seminally inherent in faith itself. The act of faith, therefore, contains within it the seed of assurance. Now, as we talked about from Pilgrim's Progress, um, that burden was still on Christian's back, even though he was a Christian, he was saved. But there was the seed of assurance. He didn't have full assurance. He had the seed of it, though. And we receive fruition of that seed of assurance the more we pray, the more we study the word in context. I mentioned in class this morning, there are many preachers who will take Scripture out of context, and you'll lose your assurance. We don't want to lose assurance. We want to have more assurance because we are trusting in the only thing worth trusting, Jesus Christ. So, <clears throat> John Murray says this, however weak, may, however weak may be the faith of a true believer, he is never in the condition that preceded the exercise of faith. What he means is, no matter how weak our faith may be, if we are in Christ, we will never be outside of Christ. We will always be joined to Christ because he saves perfectly. Um, what hinders 
the enjoyment of insurance, of assur assurance, not insurance, assurance is that he has doubts about the genuineness of that faith. He is sure Christ is able to save those who believe. His question is, how can my faith be confirmed? How do we know that we are believers? Faith seeks understanding. Assurance is nourished on a clear understanding of grace and especially of union with Christ and the justification, adoption, and regeneration that are ours freely in him. The chief enemies of the Christian's assurance are probably these three. First, our native tendency to drift from the fact that our salvation is all of grace and even our active participation in its reception is both the fruit of grace and although active, non-contributory to this salvation itself. We think of us receiving as maybe a wide receiver. A quarterback throws the ball to the wide receiver. He has to jump and make a big catch. Well, no, that's not how it works. Not in Christianity. So it's more like the, the Christian receives as the running back. How does a running back receive a ball? Well, that quarterback shoves it into his gut. And he can't possibly do it when the quarterback, he can't possibly lose it or fumble it when the quarterback is sinking it so far into his gut. And that is how we receive salvation from Jesus Christ. He gives it to us in a way that we cannot reject it, in a way that we cannot fumble it, because it is all his work. We can't fumble something that is not our responsibility. Our salvation is all of his responsibility. Uh, secondly, the difficulty some Christians have in believing that they are freely justified by the Father who in his love sent his Son for them. John Owen said this, Few can carry up their hearts and minds to the height by faith as to rest their souls in the love of the Father, they live below it in the troublesome region of hopes and fears, storms and clouds. All here is serene and quiet, but how to attain to this pitch they know not. This is the will of God, that he may always be eyed as benign, kind, tender, loving, and unchangeable. Therein, and that peculiar, peculiarly, as the Father, as the great fountain and spring of all gracious communication and fruit of love, this is that which Christ came to reveal. People want to say that God the Father is this big meanie, that he's the one who rained fire down on Sodom and Gomorrah. He's the one that slaughtered the Canaanites. <clears throat> well, that was the triune God who did that. That was Father, Son, and Spirit. The Son is was every, every bit as much a part of that as the Father and the Spirit. And we want to make Jesus out to be this nice, just hippie type fellow who's just real easy going. And that he is somehow changing the father's attitude toward us. No, the father's attitude toward us was that he chose us in love and that the son with the same essence as the father came and redeemed us and the spirit comes and applies that redemption. So the father is not some big meanie. He poured out his love on us. As it says here from Owen, he is kind, tender, loving, unchangeable. He is unchangeable. The triune God is unchangeable. Ferguson says, to fail here is sadly to lose hold of the harmony of the Trinity and to lose sight of the sheer grace of God in the gospel. God the father is absolutely, completely, and totally to us, what he reveals himself to be to us in Christ. If he loves his son, he loves us. That is end of the matter. And then the third problem is a failure to recognize that justification is both final and complete. And I mentioned a popular preacher um, named uh, John Piper. He has a doctrine called final justification. Well, you're brought into the kingdom initially by faith alone, but your works are what keep you in the kingdom or they prove to God that you're really in the kingdom, that you're really a child of God. No, justification, initial justification is final justification. It is final and complete. 
Once you are joined to Christ, you are never to be separated. Once you are joined to Christ by faith, by the grace of God, you are forever united to Christ, never to be lost. No, it is a confusing doctrine that Piper talks about, but it is clear in Scripture. We are joined to Christ, we are His, and He is ours. And we are counted as righteous before the Father as Christ Himself, the act of obedience of Christ. <clears throat> and the passive obedience of Christ. He paid for our sins, but he lived a righteous life on our behalf. Since the only righteousness that we have is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He is a great Savior, and he is ours. That is where assurance comes, that he is ours. In our previous book, An Ark for All God's Noah's in a Gloomy Stormy Day by Thomas Brooks, focused on the verse Lamentations 3.24. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will trust in in him, or I will hope in him, or I will wait for him, depending on what version you're reading. I will hope in him. My hope is that I am joined to Christ, that the Father in his love has chosen me and joined me to his precious, perfect son. Lamentations. That's why I kept saying this book is a perfect follow-up to our previous book, because it talks so much about our union with Christ, that the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Says my soul. When my soul can say that the Lord is my portion, I have assurance that I belong to him and that he is mine. Gospel assurance. Christ is everything. A high degree of Christian assurance are simply not compatible with low levels of obedience. Now, when we have assurance you find it that we are being obedient. Are we assured of faith because we're obedient? No. But what happens is when we're disobedient to God, we start thinking maybe we don't belong to him. Why? Because we're looking at ourselves instead of looking at him. When we look to him, when we read his word, when we study his word, when we pray to him, when we go to church, showing up actually on the Lord's day and worshiping with the saints, we will have a greater sense of assurance because we are doing what he has told his children to do. There is a strong link in the New Testament, Ferguson says, between faithfulness in the Christian walk and enjoyment of, of assurance. There are many Christians out there who are terrified that they're going to lose their salvation. Say the last thing they do before they die is sin. Well, it will be. Trust me, we will not be loving God as he deserves to be loved, and we will not be loving neighbor as Christ has commanded us to love our neighbor as ourselves. We will be sinning. But we so often think of the idea of getting hit by a truck and yelling out a cuss word right before we die. Well, that is because we have changed the level of the law from God's perfect standard. We've lowered it to say, well, you know, if I have a mean thought or if I say a cuss word right before I die, that's going to erase the work of Christ. Well, guess what? That's above my pay grade. I'm not that powerful. I'm not that strong that I can erase the un, um, uncuttable connection that has been put by God between me and Christ. I think of J.B. Well, there was always this joke. Well, if you break something, if something, you want to stick something together, use J.B. Weld. Well, it's not J.B. Weld because, well, I'm J.B. If I weld something, it's going to break apart. But it's the weld of the Lord, the God, God our Father, welding us to Christ, joining us never to be separated. And as he treats his son, he will treat us as co-heirs with Christ. 1 John is a book written specifically to believers so that they will know that they have eternal life. That's how it starts out. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Who is he writing to? Those who believe in the name of the Son of God. He's writing to Christians. Why? So that they will know they have eternal life. John picks out four characteristics moral characteristics, this is according to Ferguson, in the life of the believer that encourages assurance, obedience to the commands of God. Now, am I looking at my obedience and say, I'm drawing my assurance from that? No, I'm not looking at my obedience to draw assurance from that. But when I'm obedient, it tells me that I'm looking to Christ. 
It tells me I'm focused on the better thing. And that motivates me to obedience. We know that we have come to know him, scripture says. If we keep his commandments, whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. What's it say? It says has been born of God. If you believe, it's because he has made you a new creature. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. We love the brethren, right? We love fellow Christians because we love the Father. And we love the Father because he loves us in Christ. By this, we know, no, we have assurance that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Is my salvation dependent on my obedience? No. But my obedience is a fruit that I'm trusting in him. Antinomianism, remember, antinomos, against law, against the law, ignores the teaching that genuine assurance will go hand in hand with authentic command keep, commandment keeping. The antinomian says, it's by grace, free grace, who cares, I can do what I want. That's not biblical. But the legalist says, well, I must do this, and I must do that, and I must do this, and I must do that, whether it's to earn God's salvation or it's to keep it. Well, the legalist is just as wrong as the antinomian. We cannot do anything to keep it. We cannot do anything to earn it. And we cannot do anything to lose it. Biblical Christianity says it is all by grace. It is free grace. It is so free that I cannot possibly do anything to earn it. But in response, out of appreciation, I will go and love the brethren. I will love God. I will obey more and more and more and more. It's going to grow. <clears throat> um, genuine faith attests itself in righteous living. It is a response, right? We are confirmed in the reality of our regeneration by the fruit produced in us by the Spirit. Remember, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. It is produced by the Spirit. It's not produced by me. If I must be perfectly loving, I'm lost. If I must be perfectly gentle, I'm lost. If I must be perfectly faithful, I'm lost. If I must be perfectly self-controlled, I am lost. But when the spirit is producing that fruit in me, I'm growing in it and I'm loving God more and more and more. Assurance is confirmed by not sinning. Uh-oh, we're all in trouble then, right? No, it's because we decrease our sinning. We're not diving into sin as we once were. That's why reading 1 John, you can sometimes go the opposite way and lose your assurance if you're not reading it in the proper context. He says in 1 John, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. Well, we need to read that in context. What does it also say? That if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. That if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that walking in love is so much a hallmark of regeneration that it confirms the presence of faith. Walking in love. Are you a new creature, but you don't realize it? Why? Because you're looking to yourself. You're focusing on yourself instead of focusing on Christ. Focusing on Christ, we will grow in our love. We will grow in our obedience. We know that we have passed out of death into life. Why? Because we love the brothers. Do we love people that we used to not love? That we have nothing in common with except for the fact that we have been born of God, united to Christ by a sovereign, gracious work of him. Neophytus, back to the marrow of modern divinity, says, suppose that hereafter I should see no outward evidences. And so whether I had any true inward evidences, Evangelista says, let me warn you to take heed of forcing and constraining yourself to yield obedience to God's commandments. Now that seems odd. Don't run to the law, run to Christ. That's... So many times when we see someone maybe living a life that appears to be like an antinomian, we want to give them more law, more law, more law. No, we give them the gospel. Well, what's the cure for legalism? 
it's the same cure because we preach free grace, free grace from a gracious God. And we proclaim that and we give that information to people. And the Spirit does with it what he wills. He will cure antinomianism. He will cure legalism. Thomas Boston it stressed the importance, believing, giving rise to obedience. It's not the other way around. Boston, he was concerned that we get a better grip on Christ. Then the evidences will grow like fruit. On the one hand, it is possible to be a self-deceived hypocrite. And on the other hand, all too possible to be a genuine Christian who finds it difficult and is often too hesitant to draw the glorious conclusion that he is truly the Lord's. We want to harp on the first one all the time, don't we? We want to sometimes act like we're the Holy Spirit and try to show that potential false convert that they're not really a Christian. But how about the other side? We want to give assurance to that weak Christian, that Christian whose faith is weak, but they have the right object, Jesus Christ. We want to produce fruit in that way. The faith is in the fruit of the ministry of the Spirit, not of me, not of you. It is the Spirit's work. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You have received the Spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, with our spirit. That we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. That's Romans 8. Now Galatians 4 says something similar. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. What's the difference in those two statements? We cry, Abba, Father, in Romans 8. The spirit himself cries, Abba, Father, in Galatians 4, on our behalf, for us. The spirit bears witness with us and to us. Faith is a confidence that God is our Father through Jesus Christ. The Old Testament principle, two witnesses. It's the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit. Our spirit bears witness and the Holy Spirit does. Two witnesses, our spirit's own conscience and the Holy Spirit himself. And I'm going to skip a little bit here of what we went over this morning. Um, because I did a lot of reading here, but, um, B.B. Warfield talked about this, the distinct in source, it is yet delivered confluently with the testimony of our own conscience. It is with us. God testifies with us, confluent with flow, with movement. The Holy Spirit testifies with us and to us. It is the believer, we bear witness that we trust Christ, but it's also through the Spirit. And then the Spirit testifies to us this as well. Abba Father is not a restful whisper of contentment and security, Ferguson says. It is the cry of a child who has stumbled, tripped, and fallen and is crying out for his or her father to come help. That is what Abba Father is. We're crying, Abba Father, come help. Help, Father. Help, Father. I'm not having the confidence that I should. Why? Because we're not looking to Christ. Let's look to Christ. We will have full confidence of our assurance in Christ. An instinct that is absent from the unbeliever's conscience. A person may and often does cry out, Oh God, but not instinctively, Oh Father. Think about Jesus on the cross. When he was on the cross, what did he cry out? It was Psalm 22, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every other time, virtually, in Scripture, Jesus refers to God the Father as Father because it was such an intimate relationship. In the Lord's Prayer, he taught us to pray, taught the disciples to pray, our Father who art in heaven. Yet on the cross, he saw him, oh God, because he was judging him in our place. He saw him as judge by saying, oh God, or my God, my God. But when we pray to God, do we instinctively, instead of not just saying, Father, thank you, and so forth and so forth, when we start our prayer, but do we address him, you know, those guttural moments of prayer where we don't even know what to say, do we say, Father, help, as 
is mentioned in Romans 8. Abba, Father, Father, help. The one who confesses Jesus is Lord by the Spirit is also the one who cries out in a time of need, Abba, Father. Even at its lowest ebb, the believer's conscience differs by a whole diameter from that of the unbeliever. The unbeliever, they may exclaim, oh God, they may do it blasphemously or even in times of trouble. But the unbeliever can't say, oh, Father. They don't know him. Gospel assurance is not withheld from God's children, even when they have not shown themselves to be strong. What good father would want his children's assurance of his love to be possible only when they have sufficiently accomplished certain things in life to merit his love? Shame on such an earthly father, yet we impute that attitude to God our Father. If me as a father, if I said, hey kids, I'm only going to be your father if you will make straight A's. Or if you hit four home runs in the baseball game. Or if you are able to uh, dance your dance recital without making a mistake. What kind of an evil earthly father would I be? Yet we credit that attitude to God, that he's not pleased with us unless we perfectly perform for him. No, his son perfectly performed. We are united to his son. He is perfectly pleased with us in his son. The witness of the spirit goes hand in glove with the fruit of the spirit, putting to death the misdeeds of the body. B.B. Warfield again talked about the witness of the Spirit is in a word not a substitute for the proper evidence of our childship, but a divine enhancement of that evidence. A man who has none of the marks of a Christian is not entitled to believe himself to be a Christian. Only those who are being led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Are you trusting in Jesus? Are you trusting in your ground of salvation as Christ alone? The Spirit does not operate by producing conviction without reason. The function of the witness of the Spirit of God is therefore to give to our halting conclusions the weight of his divine certitude. Divine certitude. Divine certitude. I say that over and over because we want to have assurance that comes from God. We don't have want to have a... <clears throat> an artificial assurance that I'm making up a set of rules for myself to say, well, I did this and I did that, so I'm a Christian. Nope. It's all about, am I trusting in Christ? Is he my everything? Because we know he is fully capable of saving perfectly, saving to the uttermost. Actual assurance has a psychological as well as a theological dimension, Ferguson says. Even when we have developed a clear doctrine of assurance, our actual experience of it may be prevented by numerous obstacles. And then the next chapter, which we should, if the Lord wills it, go through um, in two Saturdays. We won't be meeting this coming Saturday. We'll be covering the last chapter, chapter 11, in The Whole Christ by Sinclair Ferguson. And we'll, we'll have another meeting after that in this book um, because there's an appendix of Thomas Boston on faith. So we're going to cover that as well. So we'll have two more meetings in The Whole Christ by Sinclair Ferguson. I've enjoyed this book. Uh, beyond that, our next book after this will be Gospel People by Michael Reeves. This was a book that was graciously given to us by Crossway Publishing at the Deeply Rooted Conference. So people uh, who were at the conference got a copy of this book. I've read it and studied it already, so we are ready to go with that. And we have greatly uh, or greatly appreciated Crossway donating those to the Deeply Rooted Conference. Well, I've talked for a really long time on this, but uh, nobody will probably watch it anyway except my mom. So y'all have a great weekend if the lord wills it we'll see you tomorrow morning at bass chapel 10 a.m sunday school 11 a.m corporate worship uh praise the lord goodbye